Okay, so I think now is as good a time as any to get started. I'd like to welcome everybody to the first XSA student talk of 2020 in rather unique circumstances. Um, this is also the first student talk the XSA has done in over a year, as I understand it, um, and something we're keen to continue doing. Uh, so without further ado, I'll uh, give the stage to Abigail, who will be giving us a bit of a look into forecasting and why people are so bad at it. Uh, take it away. Hey guys, I'm just going to share my screen so you can see the slides. Cool. There we go. Can I, hang on. Oh yeah, cool, we can. Okay. Hey, yep, welcome to the XSA talk. Um, a couple of weeks ago, our Thursday discussion topic was how predictable is the future, which I totally didn't just plant into the requesting discussion topics box so that I could talk about this. Um, anyway, I've now been given a platform to talk about it even more, which is great. So, uh, yeah, the future's kind of hard to predict. Um, uh, it's kind of hard to see over the Zoom link, but at least Zach Wiener Smith thinks it's mostly dominated by random shit, which makes this hard. Um, but people try anyway. So here are a couple of people who try. Uh, Tom Friedman over there has like advised the White House and you know made predictions on CNN and is is generally known for being a political pundit. Uh, Bill's flat. Bill Flax services are a little less in demand. But he happens to be really good at this. He is a retired 55 year old agricultural person from Nebraska. But as we're about to see, he happens to be really good at making geopolitical predictions. What do I mean when I say he's really good or anything? So a, a typical uh, sort of prediction you might see from a pundit online or on TV is like, you know, this could happen or, you know, if this happens, it's definitely possible that something else would happen, which is really hard to assess for accuracy. You know, when someone says the expansion of NATO could trigger a response from Russia, how, how likely are they saying that is? Is it like, you know, probable? Is it like a possibility that won't actually happen? It's really unclear and you just like can't assess that for accuracy really at all. Um, there are, however, more precise ways to make predictions without saying that something is, is certain to either happen or not. Uh, for example, 538, an excellent website that does a lot of statistical analysis, said back in 2016 that Clinton would win with 70% probability. It was actually like 72%-ish. And then afterwards, people criticized them for getting it wrong and saying that the probability of Trump winning was only 30%. Uh, if you remember back then, everyone else was giving numbers like 3% or, you know, just definitely not going to happen. So it seems like they were doing kind of better. Um, I've heard it said that million to one chances crop up nine times out of 10, but in this case, 30% chances crop up three times out of 10. So sometimes you think something's unlikely, but it happens anyway. Did you get it wrong? It's kind of unclear. Um, in general, if someone makes a probabilistic prediction that is precise, it does give a precise probability, there's this question of how do we say whether they got it right or not, or how right they got it, I guess. There's a couple of ways. So the first one is if this person is making lots of predictions, then we can take that whole lump of predictions and see how many at each confidence interval they got right. So if I you know, predict the outcome of every election in the world over a span of like five years, and I say they're all 70% likely in different directions, then I should expect 70% of my predictions to actually happen. If only 60% happen, I'm overconfident. If only 80% happen, I'm underconfident. Um, you can do this by, you know, choosing the probability you're willing to predict at for a whole range of different things and then bundling up 
those predictions into these different confidence levels and checking. Um, there's actually an online tool where you can do this, but for trivia questions where you're not sure like exactly how right it is and you're not allowed to look it up and you have to give a range that you think is like 50% or 60% likely and gradually they tell you whether you're overconfident or not, which is fun. There's a link to it at the end. Uh, there's another way to do this for individual predictions, which is you can kind of treat these probabilistic things like someone betting. So if, if I say that something's 80% likely, that means I'm willing to bet on it at four to one odds. If I get it wrong, that should hurt me roughly equivalently to having to pay four times as much as I bet. If I say I'm 95% confident, that should be an awful lot worse. Uh, so there's kind of a scoring system that tries to do this where sort of like taking it as winning or losing bets at different levels, it says, okay, we're going to measure the distance between what you predicted and what actually happened. So if I say something is 70% likely and then it actually happens, that 30% is the difference between what I predicted and what happened because it either happened or it didn't. So if I just guess randomly and say 50% for everything, that's a Briya score of 0.5. So that's roughly what you'd expect with chimpanzees throwing things at a dartboard or something like that. Uh, Godlike omniscience is you get ab everything absolutely right. So that minimizes your score, takes it to zero. So a lower score is better here. Uh, and if I get everything absolutely wrong, like I have godlike omniscience, but then I just say the wrong thing for everything, that's a score of two. Um, cool, does that make sense to everyone? I, I do want this to be vaguely interactive. Yeah, no, yeah, cool, all right. Yeah, um, but yeah, so lower the Briar score, the better it is. Uh, a thing to note here is that if I have a Briar score of like 0.3, it's hard to say what that actually means. Like, uh, it depends on what I'm forecasting. So, you know, if I said that there would be a storm sometime during summer in Brisbane at like 60% confidence, then, you know, I should be able to get a Briar score very, very low just because the weather in Brisbane during summer over that whole period is very predictable. Um, some things are harder though. So for example, there was an IARPA tournament, uh, so run by the intelligence community in the United States, uh, where the forecasters involved were answering geopolitical questions. So outcomes of different elections in different companies, in, in different countries, sorry, <laughs> um, whether certain countries would go to war or how certain conflicts would pan out, things like that. This stuff's really hard to predict. Um, you know, pundits make wild predictions and get it wrong all the time. Um, this tournament included both just some interested amateur forecasters and some actual professional analysis analysts with IAPA. The best forecasters got Briar scores right down to the 0 0.2, 0 0.25 range, which for questions as complicated and as difficult to predict like this is about as close to godlike omniscience as you can really expect a mere human to get. They also beat the IAPA analysts who had analysts who had access to classified data by 30%. So being good at forecasting, even just as an amateur, is, is better at making you actually have accurate predictions than having access to classified data. Which says a lot about the range of skill that can be involved here. The obvious next question is, okay, being able to accurately assess what is going to happen in the future seems pretty useful because you can then act on it. So how can I get good at this? Well, <coughs> uh, so the person, the researcher who was running this tournament has since written a book looking at what he calls super forecasters, the top 2% of these amateur forecasters who have consistently over at least five years by the time it was written, been able 
to forecast these geopolitical events with surprising accuracy. Um, and he's come up with a set of 11 commandments that the super forecasters tend to use or to, to think like in order to get these really good predictions. Um, it seems like this is a learnable skill and these are things he suggests having a look at. So the first one is to only do research when it will actually help you be more accurate. This seems fair enough. So what he means by this is different problems look different. Different problems are easier or harder to predict and may have more underlying predictable causal things going or not. So the way Tetlock describes this is some problems are like clocks. You can take them apart, you can have a look at how it works. And once you've done that, you understand what the clock will do. Other problems are like clouds. You know, you know they have to nucleate at some point, but it's really hard, even when you know that, to predict where and when and how it's going to nucleate or, and what the cloud is going to look like once it has. There's not much point researching how clouds work if you want to predict the shape of a cloud. And then some problems are kind of in the middle where, you know, there's, there's fuzzy things and there's things where it's not obvious what causal forces are at work, but there are still some underlying parts of the problem that are easy to pick apart and have a look at. So that's the clockwork cloud there. <coughs> Another thing he suggests is what's often called fermiization. So it's taking a problem that looks intractable, like, I don't know, will Kim Jong-un be pronounced dead by next month? And going, okay, what are some sub-problems here? You know, is he dead? Will they officially say that, et cetera? The classic example of this is not so much a predictive one, but how many piano tuners are in Chicago? Um, this is just a pretty canonical example of this process. And then you break it down into sub-problems. How many pianos are in Chicago? How often are they tuned, etc. And you break those sub-problems into sub-problems where you can. How many people are in Chicago? How many of them own and tune pianos, etc. And eventually you get a number and you hope it's in vaguely the right order of magnitude if you do this well. Uh, here's an example of a question you might try and break down into some problems. Uh, once again, this one isn't a prediction. It's trying to work something out about the present, but I'd like to unmute everyone and have a talk about this one. <coughs> so yeah, what are some sub problems we can bring up last year uh, about this one? Do you just want people to throw things out? Yeah, literally just throw things out. Cool, okay. So uh, how many people in the world use a computer? What percentage yep. of those computers are laptops? Yep. How long, what's the average lifespan of a computer? Yep. Um, those three will let you do a lot. That'll get you get all individual ownership. Yep. And then um, from lifespan, you can work out how often people are replacing their computer. Yeah, that, that's what I meant for, by that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, anyone <laughs> have any other ideas? Or, okay, let's take these sub-problems then. How many people use a laptop specifically in the world? Well, we have a, we have a nice upper, upper cap at about 7 billion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Um, I vaguely remember hearing in networks that about half the people in the world are in the internet, so like three or four billion. So they probably all need to have a computer. So if we say I, four I, billion people have a computer, sure, I mean you could just I have would, a smartphone. I would tempted to go lower oh, yeah. though, right? Because a lot of the a lot of the world's internet users are smartphone only. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. So let's say maybe two billion computers. Sure. Let's say two billion computers. I'd imagine okay. the majority of that would be laptop still because yeah. I don't imagine most people will be buying desktops when a laptop you can just carry around for and it's good enough for most things that you're going to be A lot doing. of people own desktops. I, tell you what, since you said Fermi, let's make it nice and random. Let's say 1 billion. Let's say there's 1 billion laptops. 1 billion laptops, order of magnitude? Sounds good. So yeah. yeah, we're saying about half of those 2 billion are going to be laptops. Okay. 
So 100 billion, uh, 1 billion people own laptops. Um, so now the question is how many people are going to buy a new one in a year? So how many of those laptops are going to need replacement? Well, I happen to know that in company IT, <laughs> like in, in corporate IT, the standard rollover for this kind of thing is five years. Five years. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. That's about an order of magnitude. Okay. Uh, in which case a fifth of the world's laptop users are going to replace it in any given year. So we're talking about 200 million, right? Something like 200 million. Yeah. Except that individuals will probably roll over less frequently. Okay. So but maybe a bit lower than 200, 200 million. 200, 200 million is a reasonable guess though. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I happened to look this up before the talk <laughs> and the number I found was 160 million. So we got pretty done. Oh, wow, okay. There. Yeah. So that's just an example of how close you can get just with this kind of back of the envelope uh, kind of thinking. Cool. Here's a very different kind of exercise that I also want to talk about in the group. And this is going to lead into a, a different commandment. But... I'm just assuming you can all read. <coughs> okay. So, does someone want to talk about what they're thinking? I th I'm thinking a lot of this information is superfluous. I'm but I mean, you know, maybe a family that has a kid is more likely to have a pet, no? Sure, but I think our ability to estimate that is going to be negligible. I okay, reckon so our ability to find that information either by research or guesswork <laughs> is going to be... Like, sure, it probably has an effect, but I don't reckon we're going to be able to figure out that effect. So sure. I reckon okay. this, I reckon if I were doing this problem with research, I would look, I would immediately just look to house, to like pet ownership rates in maybe a country, if I can figure out. So Chestnut Avenue, so we have... An... Oh, the book's American, <laughs> so... Okay. Can this is assume, straight can, out of that book. Can we assume that <laughs> Americans are like America centric and so these people probably live in America? Yes. Yes, you can. <laughs> um, anyway, the vague idea you've got here is you'll look up pet ownership rates in America. And then maybe if you think a family is like slightly more likely to have a pet, you might adjust up a little bit, but that yeah, sounds that, reasonable. Well, I'd, I'd look, I'd look at, I look at I look at bookkeeper, I look at daycare, and I look at a surname that is more likely than not to correspond to a nth generation immigrant family and thus more likely to live away from a rural area. And so I would then look perhaps at pet ownership rates in like cities and suburbs as opposed to, you know. Yeah, sure. But yeah. Cool. So what Felix got at here, despite not knowing where I was going with this, <laughs> was this idea of balancing inside and outside views. So the outside view here is just the general case, what are pet ownership rates in America? Uh, in this example, I think it's something like 60%. The inside view is, okay, so that's for like a generic American family, or not even family, just generic American household. What do we specifically have here? We have probably some kind of immigrant family. Uh, they have a kid and an older person involved. And so we can, you know, start with the outside view of let's say 60%. And then perhaps adjust up or down based on the specific details of what this case is like, but ultimately anchoring on that outside view. Cool. You didn't fall into the trap of starting by, oh, okay, well, he's a bookkeeper and they're in a, you know, probably Italian immigrant family and they've got a kid. So yeah, you start with the general rate of things happening. Um, a funny thing with these more geopolitical forecasts is that people will often say, a certain geopolitical event is unique. You know, you can't put it in a reference class like this. Uh, to which Philip Tetlock, the main researcher I'm basing this off, says, okay, so we'll take the class of all events that people call unique, and then we'll say, how often do those things happen? Um, and so you, you can kind of always do this, even for really weird or bizarre things. You just put them in a bizarre re reference class. Cool. Um, there's also this idea of if I have a new piece of evidence, say I find out that uh, the mum in that family is allergic to cats or something. There's this question we have to ask, which is how likely would I be to see this specific evidence if my hypothesis is true compared to if it's false? 
Um, one example that I can think of this coming up is, I don't know whether you guys have seen the like leaked UFO footage and, and people going, oh my God, there's aliens now. This is kind of what I'm thinking about that, you know, how much more likely are we to see this leaked footage if there are aliens here compared to if there aren't? And I'm not convinced it's that much more likely. That's an aside. Uh, anyway, the next question is, how do you then use this to make a more accurate probabilistic estimate? Well, <laughs> so the easiest way to do this is in terms of odds, odds ratios. So if I think it's, you know, maybe two to one in favor of aliens, because I'm a weirdo, and, and then I think it's like 10 to one more likely that this, this evidence would, would be, I'd see this evidence if there were aliens, then now it's like 20 to one more likely that there are aliens here. Um, those aren't the odds ratios I would use in the aliens case, but you kind of get the idea. You, you start with what you thought beforehand, you work out what the evidence actually says either way, and then you multiply them. Cool. Um, this one is to look for clashing forces at work. So whenever you see an argument, you know, the argument might look great, you might not have any problems with it, it might be logically watertight. But usually there's a counter argument out there, or there's an argument for the opposite thing that's just as good. And so it's important when you see an argument to try and look for what that counter argument is. Uh, the reason there's a picture of a dragonfly here is because of this idea that uh, dragonfly eyes are looking in kind of all directions at once. Um, it's important not to try and get your information or your evidence from the same place. Or if you're doing that, to then look somewhere opposing and see what the best evidence they have is as well. This one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, in particular, most of the time when people are talking about probabilities of things, they'll have like three different levels of probability. There'll be, it definitely won't happen, it'll definitely happen, and I don't know, which is roughly a 50%. And it's generally useful to have a bit more resolution than that going on. But at the same time, you know, you're never going to get to like 0.1% resolution with these things, especially if it's, you know, crazy geopolitical stuff like this. Um, from memory, I think the super forecasters in that IRP tournament were looking at about 10 or 15 different levels of how likely something was to give you an idea of about what the best people seem to be able to do is. Um, this slide's a bit blurry, sorry. Um, but there's this idea that you know you start not really sure what you're doing and you can kind of see that as different evidence has come in, this particular super forecaster has only reacted in lots of little steps. It's, it's not been that they learnt something new in February and then massively changed it to like one or zero. They just sort of, you know, changed it a little bit in the direction that the evidence pointed and then kept on going like that until eventually it looks like as this thing got closer in time, they converged on the right answer. Or at least I think it was the right answer. It might not have been, I don't know. Um, honestly, this is important outside of forecasting. Um, if you want to get good at a thing, having practice, getting feedback, and then working out what went wrong or what could have gone wrong, even if you were successful, is just a common sense way to get better at stuff. Um, Interestingly, I've also heard people talk about doing this before you actually do the thing. So like if you're making a plan or something, you ask, you know, like, how could this possibly go wrong? What's the worst thing that could happen here? And then you plan around that. Um, seems like good practice. Uh, one thing in this uh, tournament is the more ongoing research that came out of it, which was called the Good Judgment Project, um, also involved putting these super forecasters in teams. And usually putting them in teams made them get better. Uh, when this happened, it was usually because the way they were working as a team was productive. Um, they were, you know, trying to work out what different people's arguments meant. When someone gave an argument, they were going, okay, but what about this part of it? And they were willing to disagree without, you know, having it turn into a flame war. 
Um, in general, it seems like there are ways to get this wrong in both directions for pretty much everything you can do here. So just practicing a lot and if you're falling one way to start falling another, but not, you know, completely toppling over seems like a good thing. Um, and the final commandment Tetlock gives is that these aren't commandments. If there actually is a unique problem or it seems like there's something different about the evidence you have available for a certain thing, then yeah, you may as well treat it differently. Cool. Um, that's pretty much it for me, but there is a lot of information out there on this. So in particular, these are links to two podcast episodes where um, Philip Tatlock, the main researcher here, is being interviewed about his work. Um, and there's a couple of public prediction websites and that calibration training thing I was talking about earlier. Cool. Um, I should probably put these slides up somewhere so that you can actually click on these links. That is it for me. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so so much for for that. That was that was really good. That was a really good way to get things started again. I think. Um, all yeah. Let's all let's all show our appreciation. Yeah. Anyway. It's a bit weird over Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good job though. That um, was great. Yeah. So. Uh, if people want to thanks. chat or ask yeah, questions, yeah. So or I whatever. guess, do you guys have any questions? Or, yeah. So this is this is what you meant when you said sneaking. Everything I said was this. completely self-explanatory and perfect. I um, mean, you did do a really good yeah. job of explaining stuff. Yeah, pretty much. Um, um, especially the question of evidence slide was very, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the... For, for reference, for, for those who weren't talking to Felix and I before this, uh, this was kind of an exercise in how hard can I plug Bayesianism without explicitly mentioning it. Um, sorry, not sorry. The answer turns out to be pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> the, I, I'm keen to see how this recording turns cool. out, actually, because this will, this will be going up on... YouTube and maybe other platforms too, depending on what I feel like. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, Sounds good. Yeah, yeah, that turned out pretty short in the end. Um, it, no, it was good. It was. Okay. I deliberately didn't make it yeah, con cool. constrained that much with lengths, but it took like half an hour. That's what I. That's what I wanted. That's what I gave you as a ballpark. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, <laughs> great. Cool. So, so that's really good. Yeah. Sweet. I'm, I'm guessing from the lack of questions that everything I said just made perfect sense and now you're going to go out and make perfectly calibrated predictions now or something. The former, maybe not the latter. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. it's one thing for, to hear someone explain something well, it's another thing to actually go off and do it. Hey, maybe I could go talk about that. <laughs> hey, <laughs> yeah. Also, like, the amount of practice that this involves is yeah. just crazy. Um, yeah. And there's, there's a reason most of the people who've been identified as really good at this are like, you know, retired or have a lot of free time on their hands that they then spend, you know, looking up various things. Cool. Cool. Okay. Thanks for coming. It. Yeah. Won't keep people around any longer. Cool. See ya. See ya.